My name is Murray Hebert. I work on the Southeast Asia program here at CSIS. It's a delight to welcome all of you here, uh, especially for this um, uh, auspicious occasion when we have, uh, have uh, His Excellency Jose Ram uh, Ramos Horta, uh, who all of I, I think everybody in the room knows, but I'll introduce very briefly. In, in December last year, uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon announced that he was appointing Mr. Ramos Horta of, uh, to become his special representative and head of the UN Integrated Peacekeeping Office in Guinea-Bissau. Um, Mr. Ramos Horta is a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1996, and that was in, in response to his decades of work for in, uh, East Timor's independence and uh, peace and political stability and economic development. He served as president of uh, Timor-Leste from 2007 to 2012. Uh, before that, he served as prime minister, and before that, as foreign minister. So he's had a lot of key posts. He hasn't been finance minister yet, I guess, but <laughs> just kidding. So it's a delight, uh, Your Excellency, to welcome you to CSIS. He's going to speak for about 25, 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Please. It's a great pleasure to be here again in uh, CSIS in uh, Washington. Uh, I'm on a different official uh, capacity, but uh, unavoidably I uh, will talk a bit about uh, experiences in Asia in dealing with uh, uh, peacemaking. And uh, uh, then I obviously uh, will do my duty, uh, update you on my new uh, responsibilities in uh, uh, Guinea-Bissau. In September last year, uh, in Bangkok, uh, soon after uh, I left office myself, a former uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Foreign Minister of Thailand, Dr. Surakirt, former uh, Vice President of Indonesia, Yusuf Kala, former Foreign Minister of Indonesia, Hassan Uri Juda, former Deputy Prime Minister, Foreign Minister of Singapore, uh, Jaya Kumar, great eminent international law professor, former Speaker of US of uh, Philippine Congress, Jose de Venecia, former uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan, Dr. Aziz, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Malaysia Badawi, and many others from Asia region, we gather uh, following months of uh, different discussions in Timor-Leste and elsewhere to set up an organization called Asian Peace and Reconciliation Council. If you look at the, do a review of the literature uh, throughout Asia, you don't find a single uh, organization, a civic base, uh, that deals uh, with second track diplomacy, uh, offering uh, ideas, solutions to conflicts in Asia. Particularly uh, one uh, with uh, uh, former leaders with uh, regional and international authority and expertise and influence because some of the former leaders, like Yusuf Kala, for, still carry enormous influence in his own country. He's actually now uh, uh, busy uh, spearheading uh, a group dealing with the uh, Rohingya problem in uh, Myanmar. Uh, we set up the group in answering to many of us uh, question where are Asian Asians leaders in uh, living up to our collective responsibility in addressing the many challenges that the Asia region face. We hear op optimistic uh, assertions about the rising Asia. Yes, obviously Asia has been rising from 50 years, 40 years ago of extreme poverty in China and elsewhere to where today you can say the largest concentration maybe of liquidity is in Asia. 
the largest concentration probably of uh, wealth is in Asia. But Asia also is home to the largest, the percentage of poor people in the world. 60% of the world poor are in Asia. 40%, 50% of the world population is in Asia. But 60% of the world poor are in Asia. But Asia is also the most nuclearized region of the world. Not in terms of quantity of nuclear weapons, but in terms of countries possessing nuclear weapons. And uh, many in Asia think that there are shortcuts to superpower status. Why bother going through the route of the United States? You first develop education, infrastructure, strong economy, then a strong army, and then maybe nuclear weapons. In Asia, there are some who think there are shortcuts to superpower status. You don't have to resolve issues of extreme poverty, lack of access to clean water, lack of access to education, go straight, short shortcut by having nuclear weapons. That's the case of Pakistan, the case of India, but worse than that is the case of North Korea. The, uh, so that is, and uh, unlike in Europe where you have uh, two nuclear powers, UK and uh, France, they don't point nuclear weapons at each other. They used to point them at Soviet Union. Now no longer Soviet Union exists, so they don't know where to point it. So it's frozen somewhere. <laughs> and the Latin Americans, they had the wisdom not to go for the nuclear armed race. Africa, uh, also the same. But in Asia, many people seem to love nuclear weapons because it assures superpower status without having to resolve other fundamental uh, problems. You have uh, India, nuclear weapons pointing at their cousins, brothers and sisters from Pakistan, and vice versa. And of course, India's nuclear weapons pointing at China. Chinese nuclear weapons pointing at India and uh, at the United States. North Korea with nuclear weapons pointing at everybody. <laughs> and uh, at South Korea, at Japan, at the United States, as, they, as you have read, and uh, etc. Uh, <clears throat> probably the only country they have not pointed nuclear weapons at is uh, China. Uh, then there are other almost intractable, insurmountable uh, border disputes. Uh, almost every country in Asia has border disputes uh, that le led to uh, wars in the uh, past. And uh, today, one of the issues that my organization, our organization, Asian Peace Reconciliation Council, is dealing with is the South China Sea disputes. We had a recent trip to Beijing. I wasn't part of it because it was impossible to reconcile my commitments in West Africa and having to rush to Beijing for that meeting. Although the Chinese side, our, my colleagues insisted that I be part of it. And the Chinese uh, side uh, welcome uh, our idea, which we have to sell to everybody else the claimant states in the South China Sea dispute on uh, rather than trying to address the issue of the uh, maritime boundary uh, claims and the counterclaims, focus on uh, joint development in the area. And that's where the, uh, the Chinese side prefer. Next uh, June, uh, we will be going to the Philippines to discuss with the Philippines for that particular meeting, I probably will go because of my personal relations uh, with Filipinos, but also because it coincides with my uh, holidays. I now no longer criticize uh, UN holidays. In the past, I noticed they have so many holidays, and uh, now I totally support it <laughs> <laughs> because they come very handy. <laughs> so in June, I plan my holidays to go back to my country, but also to join the meetings in the Philippines. Uh, the other issue that I was the one who raised in that meeting that we must pay attention to is Afghanistan post-2014, post-US-NATO withdrawal. 
because I also often uh, said and castigate my brothers and sisters in Asia. Uh, people always too ready to uh, criticize Americans, less the Europeans, uh, for whatever uh, things that go wrong in Afghanistan. Uh, but no one else is trying to do anything to diffuse the problems in Afghanistan. Uh, Asian commitment to Afghanistan is very limited. If you uh, do body counting in terms of number of troops from Asian countries there, or uh, development assistance, or peacemaking initiatives, extremely minute. Uh, when you look at the size of uh, economies of Asia and so on. And the uh, U.S. and NATO will live. And uh, the problem will not have been solved be uh, because of, we know, the complexity, intractability of uh, the challenges in Afghanistan. But Asian leaders have to accept the responsibility and try to do something about it. Maybe where the Soviets fail, NATO and Americas might fail. We don't know yet what will be the outcome in 2014. Maybe diplomacy, uh, Asian diplomacy will succeed. We will see. What is important is that we must do something about it. And when our group was in uh, Beijing, I wasn't there, I said, but the Chinese said, please do something about Afghanistan. And these are only some of the uh, challenges uh, that uh, Asia face. In uh, about three years ago, when Prime Minister Hatoyama was, uh, when Hatoyama was Prime Minister, I was still president. I had a state visit to uh, Japan and had two hours uh, with him. And uh, very, very fruitful uh, conversation followed an initiative that I took with the then president of Maldives, Nasheed, who is no longer president. Hatoyama is no longer prime minister. Uh, to uh, persuade Asian leaders to take up an initiative on uh, climate change and sustainable development. After the failures of uh, Copenhagen, I was the only head of state who didn't bother going to Copenhagen, because I knew there would be no reaching agreement and Copenhagen was a very expensive city. I uh, didn't want there to go just to uh, spend money. And the Senate was right, complete failure. The, fo the other two f following meetings in Mexico and Durban, the same. And uh, sitting with uh, Nasheed, I said, no, we must, as the two smallest countries in Asia, we must uh, encourage leaders in Asia to have an Asian initiative on climate change and sustainable development. Enough of pointing fingers at the Americans and the Europeans for uh, pollution, for uh, environmental degradation over the past 100 years. Uh, because Asians itself, by the sheer pressure on the land because of its population, uh, has responsibilities. We all extract something from nature. Uh, just the survival of a human being in Asia because of the population pressure, that brings us responsibilities, apart from the industrialization of India and China and everybody else. And there uh, is no point uh, uh, continuing engaging in the blame game. Today, Asia is different from what it was 50 years ago. It has resources, manpower, know-how, scientists, and it has liquidity. So why not an Asian roadmap, an Asian vision on climate change and sustainable development? Mobilize something like $100 billion spread over 10 years, focusing on tree planting, putting back the trees, the hundreds of millions of trees that we took from the land, cleaning up the lakes, the rivers, the seas, restock the fish that have been depleted by Asians, by the voracious appetites for uh, seafood in Hong Kong, Shanghai restaurants, and in Japan. You know, I advise Japanese friends, why 
for a few years, don't you all become vegetarians and stop killing dolphins and uh, whales? The Japanese didn't appreciate that advice. <laughs> and uh, and uh, well, Hatoyama, I told Hatoyama, because you re recall he was elected around the same time as uh, Barack Obama. And in Japan, he enjoyed talking about how similar they are, about same age. And uh, I told him, you have a unique opportunity to change, to effect changes, particularly in your relationship, Japan's relationship with Korea and China. You people have to get over World War II. And uh, that is a two-way street or three-way street, meaning the Japanese have to take additional steps to pacify the Chinese who have legitimate grievances and the vice versa. The Japanese, the Chinese side also have to stop every time there is some political, economic trade disagreement with, with Japan, they bring up World War II. And Hatoyama, he said, I have instructed my staff to really look and see how we can uh, dynamize relations with China and uh, Korea. But in Japan, prime ministers don't last more than one year. Hatoyama lasted even less. So by the time, you know, and I continued the rounds, you know, in Singapore with Prime Minister Lee, uh, with President uh, Susilo Mbavidion. And uh, in the meantime, few of the leaders I talked to uh, were ousted. I was with Kevin Rudd in Australia. Australia never had, never had a coup in 200 years of history. Well, I met with uh, Kevin Rudd, he was Prime Minister, he, he was the darling of the uh, climate change uh, fight. He became a star in the Bali uh, conference. I uh, was there on a state visit. I was having, he knew I like port, in the Portuguese port wine, so he invited me to his uh, official residence one evening to meet and have a port. I noticed he was always on the phone and the people around was on the phone. There was some tension in the air. Well, somewhere else in the town, they were backstabbing him. And the next day he hosted a official lunch for me in the, in the parliament. By afternoon, he was overthrown in a bloodless coup. And uh, uh, yeah, you know, you're familiar with that. No? Uh, so, well, it looked like everyone I talked to, <laughs> the last casualty was Nasheed of Maldives. <laughs> and that's why Barack Obama doesn't want to see me. <laughs> because he knows, I met him briefly in New York twice, uh, four years ago, three years ago. And he knows of uh, my record in uh, causing Someone suggested, why don't you go to North Korea? <laughs> so uh, uh, I wanted with this just to introduce you the Asian Peace and Reconciliation Council. We are a new organization it started in September with some exceptional, uh, talented, gifted people. Uh, Professor Jayakumar, uh, you know, foreign minister of Singapore for many years, eminent international law professor, he's, he's the one uh, uh, in charge of uh, our task force dealing with South China. And I'm the one uh, in charge of the task force on Burma. Uh, but uh, I'm not very active at the moment because of my new uh, responsibilities. And uh, we look for uh, uh, partnerships with uh, experts for one of the uh, Harvard professor, Paul Kennedy, is one of our uh, advisors. And we look for a technical uh, partnership with uh, think tanks because we do not wish to have to reinvent the wheel. If we need research on a particular area, there are so many expert bodies that can do uh, that. So. Uh, <clears throat> Having said that, I uh, turn now to Guinea-Bissau because I agree, talk only for half hour to uh, 
in October, uh, but first let me say, in August, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was in my country. I was no longer uh, president at the time. And uh, I told the Secretary General, please uh, pay attention to the problem of the Rohingya in Myanmar, Burma. And uh, I told him, normally, traditionally, the Secretary General has to consult with the uh, parties involved, uh, countries, government, before he appoints a um, special envoy or a special representative. And I said, well, in the case of uh, Myanmar, you don't have to consult anyone because the Myanmar authorities do not recognize the Rohingya as a people there. And uh, the Bangladesh side, uh, is uncomfortable about it. So you, you could go ahead and uh, appoint. I, I don't know whether he has done that. I don't think that. There is a special advisor to the Secretary General for Myanmar. Uh, he's not a special representative. His title is special advisor. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, around October, November, I was uh, approached whether I would be interested to uh, be a uh, special president of the Secretary General in Guinea-Bissau. I accepted uh, uh, with some uh, hesitation. The hesitation had to do with uh, the Asian Peace and Reconciliation Council. Some of my colleagues, like Dr. Surakiet, initially he said, please uh, don't, you know, we are just starting, we need you here. But later they all uh, congratulated and relented. And why I accepted the challenge? Similar. Uh, challenges that we face in uh, Timor-Leste in nation building, peace building, healing wounds, rebuilding a, a country, uh, building the state institutions. Guinea-Bissau is a typical case of uh, failures of political leadership, international disengagement, lack of international interest because it is not a country that is strategically vital to anyone except of some importance to its neighbors, like Senegal, Guinea, Gambia, and so on. Uh, but primarily the problem originate uh, with a failure of leadership, and that as uh, the international community does not engage uh, in a sustained manner uh, to uh, push the leadership, situation deteriorated over the years, uh, through mismanagement, through neglect, uh, poverty is widespread, state institutions are failing, justice system fail. So next comes an army that is unhappy, uh, the army, an army that is manipulated by political elites, political elites that through normal elections wouldn't win a seat in the parliament. So what you do, you talk to the military, uh, poison them, manipulate them about those who are in power, make promise to them, and the military stage a coup. And the new government still has not resolved the problems of the country or the problems of the military. Uh, I was familiar with Guinea-Bissau before. I was there in 2003, 2004, when I was foreign minister of my country. The community of Portuguese-speaking countries, CPLP, asked me to go there, so I went and uh, familiar with how things deteriorated over the years. But a bit like Somalia or about uh, Mali, in the sense, uh, you know, stretching the comparison, but uh, why Somalia and Mali are what they are today? Through lack of international uh, engagement. Early warnings about problems, ignore, uh, gloss over by the government in the capitals, Governments are uh, fragile, uh, weak resources, unable to make the presence of the state felt in the far corners of the country. The far corners of the country are left to all kinds of illicit activities and groups. Kofi Annan, uh, in a recent conversation with, with, with him, he said, uh, I don't want the same to happen to Guinea-Bissau. I warned about Somalia, I warned about to Mali 20 years ago. But uh, media and government react to earthquakes and to civil wars. 
when you have a simmering tensions, conflict, that is not a problem. How you describe that on a three minute or one minute TV uh, news? <laughs> it <laughs> make no sense. Uh, how you write a story or convince the editors of the New York Times to send someone to talk about simmering uh, tensions in a country. No, you, the story is when there is an earthquake, like in Haiti, or in Iran, or Sichuan, or when you have a major uh, wars and conflict. So preventive diplomacy that could help the international community having save lives, thousands of lives, and save costs, enormous costs, uh, and are only uh, a jargon in the international community. The UN has been uh, advocating preventive diplomacy at least from the time of Boutrous Boutrous Ghali, when he put more emphasis on, on that. And yet, if you look at the way resources are allocated at the United Nations, first, it is the very member states, the powers that be with resources, are the ones that for the past 20 years have been emasculating the United Nations organization less and less resources to the UN. Uh, you know, sometimes I have to say, you know, the, I hope um, my remarks to the Security Council next week will not be censored. If they will not be censored, I will say this, the following. I'm often amazed why a young fellow out of Harvard without experience, a MBA, goes to Wall Street, play a few tricks, and get millions of dollars package. And uh, if he mismanage his portfolio, he leaves even with a bonus. CEOs of banks, of insurance companies, get millions and millions of dollars. The President of the United States uh, I'm not divulging any secret because the salaries are public. Who holds nuclear, uh, you know, the button nuclear weapons, he makes something like $400,000 a year. Okay, you can see it, you know, he has the White House. And uh, you can even rent it because Bill Clinton used to rent. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, the Secretary General of the UN, who has to manage relations of 192 countries, and conflicts all over the world. He gets a miserable $300,000. Yes, he has also a free house, which you know, he has not rented to anyone. And, uh, but then you have uh, these uh, incompetent manager CEOs who have bankrupted banks, insurance companies here and in England, causing havoc all over the world. They make millions of dollars. It's scandalous. And then governments who time and again tell the UN to cut off money to reduce. Some don't even pay their bills to the UN system. But they quickly find billions of dollars to rescue banks in the United States, in Greece, in Portugal, in Spain, in Ireland, everywhere, in a little uh, Cyprus. Billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars. And yet we are told again and again, over the years, there is no money for ODA. I was told in New York, I was there sitting there on the onset of the financial crisis. I was still president in the General Assembly. I heard every European leader, one after another, pledging that ODA will not fall casualty to the economic financial crisis. Everybody has cut off aid to developing countries, have cut off aid to the UN. And then you have it. A United Nations, particularly the Department of Political Affairs, a prime body that deals with preventive diplomacy, has to count every penny to uh, remain relevant. When, in fact, if DPA, the Department of Political Affairs, were to be allocated much, much more resources to hire experts, to outsource to expert bodies, to be deployed timely to places like Guinea-Bissau a few years ago. It could have resolved the problem already by then. 
or anywhere around the world, yes, it would have prevented Mali from occurring. It would have saved the UN billions, uh, the international community billions of dollars. It would have saved lives. Well, Guinea-Bissau is a prime example of the failures of the international community. Fortunately, Guinea-Bissau uh, is also a very particular people. And a uh, few, uh, two weeks ago, I spent almost a whole morning, well, whole morning plus part of the afternoon with one of the top politicians there, former president. Uh, he was ousted in a coup when actually when I was sent there, 2003, 2004, was to prevent the coup from happening. And, uh, but having spent time there and talking with him, I knew the coup was inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and everybody applauded that he was ousted <laughs> because he's quite eccentric. And in his time of lucidity in the course of the day, you know, it's really fascinating to listen to him. He, is, uh, he said he was a Catholic before, then converted to Islam, he said, because he was upset with the bishop, the Catholic bishop, the Catholic bishop kept talking about human rights. He was upset, he converted to Islam. He said, now no one hassled me anymore. And uh, <clears throat> he is Balanta, ethnically speaking. Uh, Guinea-Bissau has many uh, ethnic groups. And uh, while I listened to him, talking with him, and uh, with, I, I really in amazement how that multi-ethnic country, multicultural, multi-religion, betrayed many times by the politician, <laughs> failed by the international community, they never engage in war among themselves. Unlike in so many other countries, when the law and order break down, everybody go looting and killing. Looting happened in Manhattan. I was there in the first blackout in 1977. And uh, in Manhattan, it lasted several days. I was in my uh, 33 or 34 uh, bil uh, building. I said, well, probably it will come back in a few minutes. Well, the next day, it didn't come back. Two days later, it didn't come back. I was stuck in the apartment. Finally, I decided to come down. Then I read the news how, <laughs> you know, the city was being looted, you know, in, uh, people who drive off cars, you know, they go to car stand. And that happened in, um, uh, in uh, uh, Louisiana in uh, New Orleans, and it happened in the uh, UK, you recall, a few years ago. It happened in Paris a few years ago. I was in the middle of it in, uh, in Paris, and was uh, stuck in, that, in those uh, demonstrations, actually near, uh, in, on, uh, near uh, Jardin de Luxembourg, near uh, Sorbonne. Guinea-Bissau never was looting of government buildings, shops, no ethnic killing, religious killing. And I thought, God, these people are the ones who teach us, in my own country, how this is possible. So that is an extraordinary positive feature of that society. You have three societies there. One, these people I refer to. You have the politicians and you have the military, disconnected from each other. Connected only when the military do a coup then there are sanctions and affect the common people. Well, the good news is, after uh, weeks of uh, work by all of us, particularly by ECOWAS, the uh, South West, uh, West African uh, community, African Union, the CPLP, all of us working together, uh, with the local authorities, they have come out just now with a roadmap that we have insisted on to uh, bring about to uh, uh, do elections end of this year, an inclusive government. And I have uh, insisted my clear message to them. They probably, uh, they have heard me ad nauseum. Do not do the same of the past. Winner takes all. Because some of the nefarious uh, influences of the West is that uh, you have elections, and uh, after elections, the majority rule. Even in the West, it's not, not everybody is happy to be in uh, opposition. I don't know of anyone in the United States, 
or anywhere in Europe or in Australia who's happy to be in opposition. So, but you know, in some countries you, you are respected, you have a status. In many of our developing countries, you are, if you are in opposition, you are a second class citizen. So everybody wants to be in power because power means accumulating of a fortune quickly. Guinea-Bissau, everybody wants to be uh, in government. And one day, joking with some of the Guinea-Bissau politicians, I have a simple solution. We make here a government where everybody in this country is a minister and everybody is an MP. Problem solver. It's only 1.6 million people, so why not every adult become a minister or an MP? <laughs> so I told them, please, you know, the next elections have to be all winners, no losers, meaning whoever becomes in the first place must invite the second party, the third party, to join in a government of a national salvation, unity. Easier said than done. You require a strong leader, charismatic, smart, pragmatic, flexible, who knows how to handle this kind of coalition or unity governments. The challenge the country faces are enormous. I have said, maybe in a dramatic fashion, they are on the edge of the state ceasing to exist. A state, in the conventional definition of it, ceased to almost exist. So now they have a, we have a roadmap, but then second will be the challenge to the international community, and I end here. The international community, I will be telling the Security Council and uh, others, cannot also do things as usual, like in the past in regard to Guinea-Bissau and many other countries. They push for elections. Elections are held, everybody declared. Preferable if you have a President Jimmy Carter going there as well to certify. Everybody declared mission accomplished. And then the government and others are left on, them, on their own. The international community has to re-engage Guinea-Bissau to help rebuild the state. The state institutions have to be rebuilt one by one. For instance, the IMF should send two, three or more officials to manage the Minister of Finance, the Central Bank, the Minister of Justice. So meaning the UN has to have a, a similar experience that it was, did successfully in Timor-Leste. I don't refer to 99 to 2002 because that was different status. Timor-Leste was a non-self-governing territory. The UN was, had full executive legislative authority in Timor-Leste from 99 to May 20, 2002. But even after that, from 2002 till uh, many years later, we had a lot of international experts across the world, even in my own office, in the president's office, or when I was uh, prime minister, I had a lot of international advisors. And that's the only way, you know, uh, much while we respect people's pride, while we respected our own pride, you know, I always said to our people, I really don't care. This is a globalized world. We are all human beings. Ideally, there should be no borders. If I have a no human resource to help me manage the country, I'm very happy to have it. Australians, Americans, Indonesians, Japanese helping us. Uh, we are all human beings. But some people have uh, these uh, false notions of pride that misplaced. When I was prime minister, I was managing the country in very critical circumstances. Some of the MPs asked, questioned me about the presence of Australian troops in New Zealand, and I said, and I said, my first responsibility as prime minister of this country is to provide safety, tranquility to the people. If I cannot do it, with our own forces, I have to ask international help. And the country accepted. And that's what I am trying to also educate the South Guineans to accept the concept, the notion that 40 years after independence, in 2014, after the election, they will have to 
bring back the international community. Will it come back? Well, that's a whole different question. European Union is very sensitive, educated about it. I presume they will uh, wholeheartedly support. We can find non-traditional uh, donor uh, help like Qatar, China. I know uh, China is not uh, uh, a great name to pronounce in Washington these days, but uh, uh, you know, as a potential partner, ally of Guinea-Bissau or any country, but uh, China has liquidity, it has its own interests, and uh, actually uh, China and a few other countries like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, they should be contributing, or India, much more to the UN uh, Treasury. You know, the, there has to be, I, uh, I'm afraid I have to disagree with some of the countries like China, that resist reviewing the way the contribution is assessed. Uh, because as it is, it goes back 50 years, it serves their, uh, their interests. Uh, with the US paying disproportionately more, uh, followed, I think, by Japan, when Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar, Kuwait, India, uh, should be paying much more uh, to compensate for the loss of all. So we will be looking uh, for uh, donor uh, assistance to help rebuilding Guinea-Bissau. That's my uh, comments uh, today. I thank you and very happy to answer questions. Your Excellency, thank you very much for, uh, uh, first of all, for your introduction to the Asia Peace and Reconciliation Council and description of the efforts that the Council is working on, and then a uh, description of your current work uh, with Guinea-Bissau. Guinea um, we're open now for questions. Um, does, uh, maybe I could start uh, on, you said you were responsible for Burma, Myanmar in, the, in, the, uh, in your Council. Uh, you described the Rohingya problem, which uh, former Vice President uh, Yosef Kala is working on, which is obviously a very critical problem, uh, the violence and the dis dislocation of the Rohingya. But in, in um, recent months, actually the last month or so, we've seen communal violence break out in, in, uh, in outside of uh, Rakhine State. You had it happen just south of Mandalay about a month ago. And uh, you had it happen Tuesday, uh, just north of, of, um, of Yangon, where uh, communal violence broke out between Buddhists and Muslims. And so I guess one challenge I'm throwing out there is working on Rakhine State is good, but Myanmar, Burma, as it's moving toward democracy uh, and as it's trying to f um, hopefully get the military out of politics, um, it, it faces some real serious challenges in, 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 um, in building a polit new political system and, and, and maintaining peace and security without the military running everything. And I'm just, I guess my challenge is whether you, your, your uh, council has talked about whether there might be other areas in which you could provide advice and counsel to the new government in Napida. Uh, yeah. uh, the Rohingya problem was just one problem that we uh, discussed, uh, but actually uh, uh, our uh, chairman, Dr. Surakiet, with a delegation, did go to uh, Myanmar recently, uh, because in our uh, membership you have uh, some leaders with tremendous uh, expertise in uh, state building, in reform of public administration. Uh, like Dr. Aziz from uh, Pakistan, he was the only prime minister that s served full term, uh, you know, in office a few years ago, uh, or uh, our many Singaporean uh, colleagues. So uh, we offer not only uh, like second track diplomacy, helping uh, mediation, but actually our group able to mobilize resources, expertise, to help reform, for instance, the banking finance system in uh, Myanmar. So that was the fact-finding group that went there. I think it was in uh, January uh, they went there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will be working. The, the, I've been to Myanmar uh, before. I've, first time ever I went to Myanmar was 
clandestinely, illegally in 94. <laughs> to do, uh, I enter uh, through, uh, uh, go northern Thailand, the border, and went to Manaplo uh, to do uh, conduct human rights diplomacy uh, training to NLD people. Then, uh, as I left back to uh, Thailand, I was declared persona non grata in Thailand <laughs> <laughs> for other reasons. Then I went in 2005, uh, 2005 uh, as foreign minister to establish diplomatic relations with Myanmar. My delegation was only two or three small people and a tiny delegation. I met with 30 generals. It was intimidating, you know. Uh, and uh, one, the, the Tan Sui, the you know, top, he said, welcome to Myanmar for the first time officially. And they, <laughs> they smiled at each other because they knew I had been, and I was blacklisted before. Uh, and uh, I always uh, believe, you know, f in message to the international community and uh, not message to, to Su Chi, because who am I to advise her? But uh, what she's doing now is what I always thought would be inevitable. No democratic transition, no democratic regime in Myanmar will survive six months if you don't develop a careful partnership with the military. For a long, long time, you have to do that. And she is doing the right thing. Sometimes maybe she's criticized for overdoing it, maybe in some comments. But look at Indonesia, you know. The remarkable transformation of Indonesia from 99, 2000 to today. When uh, 10 years ago, you know, I said countless times, Indonesia will change on their own time, their own clock. Justice will come, but when the Indonesian society is ready, the military will be gradually out of power. And today is really a remarkable transformation. I said the same uh, in my own country, you know, when people were talking about justice, just, I said, uh, well, sometimes, you know, when we fight for human rights, when we fight for democracy, that's I tell our people, you know, we fight because of our convictions, our belief. We fight with our heart, but we also have to fight with brains. You know when you have to take a step forward, when to wait, when to take a step aside. You don't go into obstacles you know, blindly, just because you believe the other side of the obstacle is something you want to achieve. Well, that's what our philosophy in my country. Today we have a fabulous relationship with Indonesia. Indonesia is our number one advocate for membership in ASEAN. When I was in Davos in uh, January, I went to uh, a reception hosted by the Indonesian Minister of Trade. You know, he didn't even know I was there, but I heard there was an Indonesian reception and I told my colleagues, I said, listen, let's go because they always have a great food. <laughs> and uh, so we went there, and they did have great food. But the, foreign, the Minister of Trade immediately invited me on the podium the stage. I was the honor guest, and everybody there was surprised, you know. Uh, Indonesia, Timor-Leste. Well, I have told the Japanese friends, Chinese, and the Koreans, look at how Timor-Leste and Indonesia have come along in such short period of time. It means leadership. So, uh, Lynn, and can I just ask if people ask questions to introduce themselves briefly? Thank you. Lynn?
uh, it's a gigantic institution. Uh, problems have been there uh, for uh, decades. So it's very, it's a mind-boggling uh, exercise to think about reform of the Myanmar security forces. But one approach would be that you know, someone would encourage them. And the, the country you know, uh, that uh, I always uh, argue that best place to help Myanmar is Indonesia. I discussed this years ago with President SBY, uh, Susil Bambang Widyono. I said, you must do more on Burma. And uh, uh, I talked to Ban Ki-moon about picking a former Indonesian military, you know, one who people know is good, uh, also a politician, to talk to the military in Myanmar. Because Indonesia's experience, because first, Indonesia has no borders with Myanmar, and that's good. Because when you have borders with a country, uh, sometimes, you know, often, it's not terribly, you are not terribly neutral or well perceived. Uh, so Indonesia, because Indonesia had similar problems to Myanmar in the past, not as bad, but similar. And they have been able, under the current president himself, Susilo Wanwiliano, began the reform, modernization of the um, Indonesian armed forces without threatening the interests of the armed forces. And that's a good message for uh, Myanmar. But the process has to be come out within the Myanmar armed forces. You have to find ways so that they are the ones who initiate the pro. They own it. In my own country, when we transitioned from guerrilla to modern army, it was our uh, leaders in the army that began to develop the concept Vision 2020, our uh, transformation from guerrilla to uh, regular army. We then invited foreign advisors. We have uh, quite a few. In Guinea-Bissau, I'm telling the same to the military there. You, from winning your army, you come up with your vision, your, what you want for the, for the army, for the country. And then we get you foreign advisors. So if you make, make feel them that, because any thinking general, you know, officer, they know they have to modernize. They have to adapt the army to the new realities in Myanmar, in the region. Uh, and I think it's possible, but it takes a long time. Not only the army, but the police. The problem with the violence in Myanmar, the presence of the military, I don't know whether some in the military were actually the ones behind the scenes instigating the violence. Sometimes they instigate because they're also xenophobic, uh, anti-Muslim, or sometimes they do instigate violence to be relevant. You know, uh, in the past there were accusations in, uh, against Indonesia uh, way back in the beginning of uh, the, the uh, reformacy in Indonesia. There are communal, communal violence in uh, Ambon, in uh, Kalimantan. People were wondering whether some in the security force were not involved, you know, because when you know, because some in the military they think they are relevant, you know, in uh, periods of uh, wars and conflicts and tensions, in times of peace, they look they lose relevance. So, and uh, the same uh, is said about uh, Pakistan, the way uh, some in the Pakistani army intelligence. Uh, so you have to, uh, it is not a black and white issue, and it will take, uh, it will, there, unfortunately, there will be a lot more suffering, violence in uh, Myanmar before anyone can do anything about it. The military, the government are ultra patriotic, proud. Of all the peoples in uh, Southeast Asia I have dealt with, the most proud you know, uh, about to foreign uh, involvement is, are the, the Burmese. You know, people don't, you know, uh, in our case, in Timor, my case personally, you know, anyone is welcome to help. Whether you are from Martian, you are from the United States, welcome to help. But in some countries, it's, you know, they prefer to have uh, let people die and so that you don't lose the pride, you know, like look at the Ethiopia under Selassie, Emperor Selassie. Why he was overthrown? 
that a huge famine, which his government denied, denied for many years, until the military were tired of it and overthrew him. And uh, so it's difficult to uh, provide any uh, uh, answer to that. Also, exceptional good relations with Portugal, like we do have exceptional good relations with Indonesia or with Australia. In that regard, uh, and Portugal was in the forefront of our uh, diplomatic uh, battle for 24 years. So, and Portugal became one of the largest proportion of per capita wise partners to Timor-Leste. So we continue to have a very good relationship with Portugal, like we do with all other Portuguese-speaking countries. But Timor-Leste is Southeast Asia, geographically speaking. And we applied a few years ago to join ASEAN. The process is underway, very actively supported by Indonesia. We even have Indonesian top diplomats for several years working in our foreign ministry, advising us. Uh, the Indonesian diplomats are totally frustrated because uh, uh, we are so slow, and the Timorese always, we do things last minute. If you tell, as I always tell my compatriots, let's plan 2014 to do this and that, they wonder why the hell is talking already about 2014, we are only 2012. So the notion of our planning is not part of our culture. <laughs> so the Indonesian, one of the senior Indonesian ambassadors who has, came to advise us, it's totally frustrated. But we are working. We have a, now a Secretary of State for ASEAN integration. Uh, the Prime Minister, Shannon Guzman, leading also directly. We hope that by 2014 we can join before the entering into effect of the ASEAN community. And before Susilu Bambang Widyonu uh, leaves office, his last term in office, because he has been our main advocate. And it would be great, symbolic, that he, under his presidency still, that Timor-Leste join. Portuguese remain one of the two official languages. Tetum is the official language, but also Portuguese. And we have two working languages. Bahasa Indonesia, which is spoken by 36% of the people, and English, much less. I, I don't trust much our statistic, but... Uh, it's quite high at the moment. You know, many people, particularly in the capital, learning English. So it will remain like that for a while. And uh, some argue that uh, it was silly on our part to choose Portuguese as official. Like I have to say, I, I don't mention his name, a good friend here in Washington, in the US Senate, uh, Senator, lovely man, the most decent person you can find in the Capitol Hill. I don't mention his name because I'm a bit embarrassed. He's a great man, good friend. One day he invited me here in Washington. He mobilized everybody to come to have a coffee with me. Even Joe Biden was there when he was senator. And Ted Kennedy. And he said, Jose, you know we love you in this house. Every time you ask us this and that, we always help. But that idea of having Portuguese as official language is the silliest thing I have heard from you. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, if you chose English, Timor Leste would jump start into 21st century. Well, at the time, Liberia was front page every day in the US. <laughs> and uh, I told uh, him, I have to be careful not to say his name, 
I say, are you saying that your former call in Liberia is already in 21st century? <laughs> well, English is important, but it is not the open doors to all our, uh, you know, to paradise. I can mention any number of countries in Asia, in Africa, that have English as first language since independence, and they are not exactly 21st century. And I can mention some in Africa that have a Portuguese and doing very well, without oil, without gas, Cape Verde. Cape Verde is one of the best run country in Africa or in the world. No oil, no gas, they have only stones, rocks, and no tourism, <laughs> and Portuguese speaking. Uh, I can mention others, uh, Costa Rica, no army, no oil, very affluent and speak Spanish, not English. So because some you know, th really think that English would resolve all humanity's problems. <laughs> no, <laughs> it is not. It, it helped tremendously with access to science, to technology, and so on. But Timorese are incredible polyglots. You, find, you don't find a Timorese who doesn't speak at least three, four languages. They pick up Spanish easily. We have a Timorese who went to study in Cuba, medicine. They all came back already. And it's amazing how they learn in two, three months. Very fluent. I speak Spanish. And when I converse with them, amazed. And I ask, how long have you been studying? Oh, one month, two months, three months. We have students working in Korea. They speak in Korean language. One even did a PhD in Korea, in Korean language. We have hundreds in China, in different uh, degrees, speaking fluent Jap Chinese. And we had few went to Japan, to the Japanese Navy Academy. I felt so sorry for those four guys. I said, God, you survive a Japanese school, a Japanese Navy Academy, I will be impressed. And they did, and they did very well uh, in the Japanese Navy Academy somewhere in the south, very strict. So we, are, we, we don't have problems with that. Only Americans, Australians, who only speak one language, <laughs> are confused with how, why the Timorese speak so many languages. <laughs> Your Excellency, thank you very much for coming here to CSIS today. I, I think all of us enjoyed your, your perspective, your uh, perceptions, your experience, and so we want to wish you all the best in your new posting, and we hope we can welcome you back here in a few years for another, um, another uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking you.